So I played through Halo Infinite's campaign. We've talked about our initial impressions, had time to let that sink in, and I think now is the proper time to start talking about spoilers. So in this video, I'm gonna give you my spoiler review of Halo Infinite, because there's a lot to talk about. So stay tuned throughout the whole video to understand all the details. How's it going Halo fans? Kevin here once again. Today we're doing another discussion about Halo Infinite's campaign that recently just released this week. I was able to play it early, which I have a video talking about my first impressions. If you guys want to check that out, it's on the channel here. But now I've had time to let that story sink in, I had time to see other people finish it as well to kind of get their opinions and feels on the whole thing. If they mirror my sentiment or if they're bringing up some new topics I didn't think of. And I would say mainly my experience from playing the campaign still holds true. And so I think I want to talk about this. So first I want to talk about just like the intro of the game, right? Where you get to see like the battle happening between Master Chief and Aatrox. That cutscene is absolutely amazing. Uh, where you get to see the infinity it looks to be kind of blown up. Uh, I can't remember exactly if they said that the infinity is completely destroyed. I think they've just mentioned that it's like incapacitated in a way, but not completely destroyed, which kind of would make sense if they want to see that come back in some way. I'm kind of banking on the infinity being destroyed though. I mean, I guess you can count that intro cutscene of it being destroyed, but I would really like to see that happen like in game, not like off camera kind of thing, because that ship is the flagship of the UNSC, like the most powerful ship. And if the Banish can take on that, being, I would just think it'd be super important to show that happen to the viewer rather than just kind of talk about it. The UNSC audio logs do do a great job of filling in the gaps when it comes to the story of the UNSC Infinity. It sounds like it's lost and blown up. I haven't had a chance to unlock all of them and then listen to them all i'm sure there's a youtube video out there somewhere but for the most part it sounds like the unsc infinity is out of order now i got major ce vibes from the beginning and part of this game for one kind of going through that corridors of that banished ship total like ce vibes right there and then then you go into more corridors with like the forerunner structures that feel very much like like combat evolved forerunner design which is absolutely perfect and then you're finally let out into the open world and that's when the game kind of really feels like it breathes and comes alive there were actually quite a few easter eggs within the outpost Tremonius guys if you guys haven't checked it out yet i have a video detailing all of the, the easter eggs are in that location so the game kind of leads you towards like the tutorial section right where you kind of understand how the four operating bases work and what you need to do to gain more valor and things like that without having to like, sit through like press a to do this thing for the tutorial but the gameplay of halo infinite is absolutely fantastic i love doing all the little side missions along with it as well the main missions are fantastic my favorite thing right now is just to gather a group of marines into a, a razorback and then just running through something and causing this huge havoc like especially at these banished bases oh my god dude it's just so much fun taking on hvts is super fun saving marines picking up sparring cores going throughout the world and just picking up these little goodies that are just really fun to do the world itself it can be rather empty of feeling at times but for the most part where you're kind of traveling from a to b from your locations you'll come across like random groups of bad guys out there to kind of try to stop you and then pretty much every location that you go to has some form of a battle or some kind of story to tell with like the environment or or story itself. Continuing on with the gameplay aspect, but going really deep into the boss battles that we have within Halo Infinite. This is the first time we've had like true like setup boss battles since Halo 2. And Halo 2 didn't really do a good job with the boss battles within that game. I would say like the heretic was pretty good for a boss fight. Um, for everything else, like punching an old man in the chair, not exactly like the most thrilling experience. But Halo Infinite nails these boss battles, guys. Like it's still really great to see that like the fundamentals of Halo still apply to most bosses where like Plasma Weaponry does really well against shielding, physical weapons do really well against the health. So it's up to 343 to create new gameplay mechanics with each boss to make them feel unique. And they actually pulled that off. The first boss fight you're going to against Tremonius really helps sets the stage when it comes to boss fights moving forward. This is probably the most basic and maybe probably the easiest one as well. One boss fight I was a little let down on was uh, Hyperius and Tavares. They're kind of like double teamed together on that one. We're just kind of out in the open world after completing a main story mission. 
and I kind of was just, I guess I was just kind of hoping to see them a little bit more involved with the story in some capacity, especially since we had those two revealed in a cannon fodder, which revealed really interesting things about these Spartan killers, especially Hyperius, who had a necklace of Spartan fingers and has Locke's helmet on his shoulder. That doesn't get discussed at all within the game. You wouldn't even notice it if you actually stopped and looked at his armor. I was like, dude, what? Like, they're not gonna talk about this at all? That's such a huge thing that happened within the world of Halo, like the last, Basically, the main character of Halo 5, Locke, and his helmet has been destroyed. And last place we saw him was on the UNSC Infinity, so, like, what happened? Maybe it'll get discussed in a future DLC or something, but, like, that needs to be figured out. There's that one boss at the excavation site, I can't remember the name of them, but, like, that one with the brute has, like, this gravity hammer, just, like, this insane jump that, like, one-hit melee you. That one is really hard because of the confined space, lack of environmental damage that you can put onto him and things like that. Uh, there are some ways to do it, but that one's probably the one I struggled the most with. I'd probably say the best one was Jago. One, because he had a nice, cool cinematic reveal. Jago Redemption now he just looks completely badass. And the way the mechanics of the room were set up with like a two-story kind of small shadowy kind of environment. There's plenty of fusion coils you can utilize against them. There's different ways you can utilize your movement, your equipment and things like that. Like you're also utilizing your uh, motion tracker, which you should probably upgrade your mo motion tracker all the way to fight against a lot of these invisible elites and the silent shadow that's in the game because it's a freaking amazing ability. The only boss fight I really kind of felt like it was unfair was the final boss fight. Again, guys, we're talking about spoilers here. So watch out, uh, we're fight we fight the Harbinger at the end of the game, which we'll talk a little bit more about the Harbinger when we get to like the story elements of this video. That boss fight, guys, while fun, was incredibly difficult and annoying because of the lack of cover and the amount of angles that you're getting shot from. I don't want to play this on Legendary because of that last boss fight. I mean, I'll have to see how it's like when you unlock your, all your equipment, when you have it all fully upgraded or something that might change the experience. My initial playthrough, I really need to kind of speed run like the two thirds of the game just to finish it before the deadline, before I was out of town for the weekend. That's kind of the awesome part about this game is that like, no matter what playthrough, it's all gonna be unique and different. Okay, next, let's get off the gameplay and the mechanics of the game. Let's get right into the story elements of the whole thing. The first thing I want to talk about is this one scene that we saw in a trailer that wasn't in the game. Because this scene from one of the original trailers for the campaign had this right here. And this is something that got me really excited because I thought that was going to be the potential of Mendicant Bias showing up within the story. Because many times, Mendicant Bias is depicted with having three glowy dots on the face. And you can see it reflecting on Master Chief's helmet right here. Obviously, this is in a different orientation that we've seen traditionally for Mendicant Bias' uh, representation within the comics. Though, it just really got my hopes up, and we just never see this throughout the campaign whatsoever. Obviously, this is not the first time we've seen something in a trailer to not show up in the actual game. This happened in 2020 as well for that short campaign trailer, so a lot of things have changed since 2020, so maybe that scene got cut, or maybe saved later for a DLC or something like that. We did see at the very end, when it comes to the legendary version, which I actually did post the uh, end credits cutscenes, we have one end credits cutscene, the legendary edition of that actually has dialogue play out through it. And at the very end, it talks about offensive bias being deployed, which you guys don't know in deep lore, there was Mendicant Bias, who was basically like the Forerunners version of Cortana that went a little bit crazy and sided with the Flood. Then the Forerunners created offensive bias to fight Mendicant Bias. So why would you need to deploy offensive bias? Well, because of Mendicant Bias. Which if that's the case, guys, like, Mendicant Bias is pretty much directly tied to the Flood. I thought that he got destroyed, but maybe there's like, I know that the lore of Zeta Halo has like these stations that could still hold Mendicant Bias or something like that. I think it's kind of synonymous with that Mendicant Bias gets deployed, so it most likely would be the Flood. And since we're on that topic, let's talk about the Flood and the lack of them being in the game. I was genuinely shocked about that. With how much influence Combat Evolved has on this game, this is a very like CE style story and gameplay when it comes to Halo Infinite, to not have the Flood was a bit of a shocker to me. But after playing through the campaign, I was thinking like, if you just threw the Flood on top of all this, it would make the story really messy. And that was kind of the idea of Halo Infinite to be a really straightforward, focused story and that's exactly what we got it's very combat evolved feeling where it doesn't like dive too much into like the deep lore and stuff like that but it looks like we'll begin into it probably in the next edition of halo's campaigns and the story mainly just kind of helps set the stage of halo's storytelling moving forward which i think is a per great purpose for this 
And also the lack of the flood, while disappointing, I think could lead to something even greater coming with this. Because there is lore of the flood being contained on Zeta Halo. I believe that's also referenced as well. The flood is certainly referenced within uh, this campaign, but I believe it was referenced that there is a containment of the flood on Zeta Halo, so we could see that come around eventually. I'm expecting when the flood do return, I mean, they're gonna come back like it's the flood guys come on like they're gonna come back i mean 343 even wrote in the flood uh, during halo wars 2 so like it's totally possible i'm expecting like an entire like event like world changing campaign changing event where like the flood take over the open world of zeta halo now that sounds a actually quite a bit cooler than just kind of like having them as a third faction within this campaign. I just have a feeling that 343 has larger plans to have the Flood return. And then if the Flood, like I said, were in this game, it would kind of get messy with too many villains. Let's talk about some of the characters. Obviously you play as Master Chief. I think this Master Chief does a great job of blending like the Halo 4 Master Chief that really gave you a lot of insight of how he feels within the situation, uh, but also blending in like the classic one-liner Master Chief as well. I think the, his mild dialogue and what he says throughout the game of Halo Infinite was about right. Like it's about the nice blend between the two. It wasn't just like a stoic badass, but also wasn't like this emo kid that was kind of like in Halo 4. The weapon I think was a really fun addition. It very much like, feels like Cortana, but like wasn't exactly Cortana. I mean, functionally she's Cortana, but like emotionally how I feel about the weapon, it feels like a totally different character from Cortana, which like hats off to Jen Taylor for having to do triple duty in this game to voice Catherine Halsey, the voice Cortana, and also voice the weapon. And all making them have unique voices that's like highly skilled, like tip of the hat, man. That was very well done. My jaw was dropped when Master Chief tried writing the protocol to the leader. Yeah, things got a little awkward between the two after that. They had a really nice balance between like new and naive kind of AI, but not being annoying, which can happen a lot with that design of character and stories. But we're definitely gonna be seeing a lot of the weapon moving forward, probably gonna be acting just like a Cortana, but new. And since we're talking about Cortana so much, let's talk about Cortana within the story. I'm still kind of like unclear if Cortana really is dead, because throughout the game, you're getting like these whispers in your mind, kind of recalling old data that's apparently floating throughout the world of Zeta Halo and then kind of interacts with Master Chief and then you hear like these memories from Cortana and stuff like that until the very end where it seems like you're face to face with actual Cortana even though she's supposed to be dead but then she's not kind of dead but still kind of alive but also not here it's it's kind of murky to me at least it kind of felt unclear if she actually does die in this game because she just kind of like walks away and fades away like well, what changed from before you met me to after you met me? Like this the only thing that changed was like a bit of dialogue because she directly interacts with Chief and has a back and forth discussion. So she's definitely like alive during that section. But is, is it kind of like a giving herself up to the force moment like in Star Wars that we had? I, I, I don't really know. I have a feeling like Cortana is still going to be involved with the story. Um, but I mean, does this mean like the whole created versus the creators kind of story arc is just gone now? What's going on with the Guardians? Uh, there's a lot to be discussed right there. That's just like, that really provides more questions than actual answers. I have a feeling it's gonna be something like where she's dead, but not gone kind of situation. Kind of like a friendly ghost to come by every once in a while to say hi. I think I might need to watch some like lore channels to kind of really understand if, ex exactly what happened right there because I'm still pretty confused if Cortana is actually dead. Like dead, dead this time, not like Halo 4 dead and came back in Halo 5, but like actually like deactivated, gone. I, I not, I'm not sure about that. And of course, when we're going to talk on the characters. You got to talk about the main villain, the main villain being Eshram. And he was a pretty good character. Like that was really fun that every time he was on screen, totally sold the show. Like his voice acting was on point. His lines were on point. Like it just was awesome. My only gripe, this is more of a personal thing that I kind of wish that you kind of saw him in game a little bit more. Like Master Chief came across him like a couple times or something. You know, oftentimes with video games and also just in movies as well, like the first time you come across the main villain, you get your ass beat by them, which we kind of saw with Atriox, but not with Eshram. And then, you know, later down the line, the character kind of learns new skill traits and new powers, goes up against the main villain again and wins. We didn't really experience that this time. It's just kind of like you're going, you're making your way up through middle management through these Spartan killers to eventually get to Ashram at the, towards the end of the game, which does make sense. You know, the way they kind of set up the story and things like that. I just would like to see like 
you face against Eshram one time to really emphasize like how much of a skilled badass he is because we never really got to feel that within the game. It was just more kind of told to us, but Eshram certainly gives off that impression just through these amazing cutscenes that he's in. And of course, you know, he's the main villain in a Halo game, so you kick his butt and kill him. I just thought it was kind of odd that like Master Chief had like sympathy for Eshram when he killed him. I mean, the story just kind of set itself up for that situation of Master Chief kind of like coming to terms with like, are we really the good guys kind of feeling? Uh, but I mean, Eshram like literally killed like thousands of humans, like just because he wants to have power. Like I understand like he's a soldier and got caught up in the wrong decisions, but it's like he literally did like really bad things. like really really bad things i don't know why having any kind of sympathy for a character like that i wasn't feeling it i was kind of like oh well it's you know nice like soldier to soldier you know like you were just, i mean they were on different sides it just kind of felt a little weird though like they, they definitely set itself up for that moment to happen so like you know good job on 343's writing team to actually make it a logical situation i just don't think like mass murdering an entire species is okay to be like you know you just made some bad decisions I think my biggest gripe throughout the entirety of the story is the lack of the harbinger within this game. We see that intro scene, that's kind of what I was talking about, like where you have that main bad person who kicks your character's butt, and you see him again later on, and then you kick their butt back. You have that experience with the Harbinger for the initial meeting, and then the Harbinger kind of like shows up in these cutscenes with Ashram like in a whatever location far away, but you don't really like learn about like the Harbinger rather than she is, is probably, apparently the Endless, like a species called the Endless, I guess, that are going to rise back up again and all that kind of stuff, but then obviously they don't because you, you kick her butt at the end of the game for that final boss fight. That character definitely felt like a... 343 rating character if that makes sense like what i mean by that is like the main villain from the didact in halo 4 didn't really feel that fleshed out uh, i just kind of felt like i hate humans because i hate humans and i'm the bad guy kind of thing the twist of cortana being a villain which is kind of really forced and didn't really feel like it should have happened with halo 5 and we really don't learn much about the harbinger rather than the harbinger is just kind of like the third person that's kind of in the mix that can help out Ashram for i guess lighting the ring which you need to reconstruct the ring before lighting it, which definitely starts happening throughout the campaign. But I really like don't know who the Harbinger was, who are the Endless, why are they on the ring? Don't really get involved with that at all. And then you kill her at the end, so I guess it won't really have a chance to answer any of those questions. Unless there's like upper management of the Endless in some capacity that will come back later on to kind of answer a lot of these questions. To me, that was like the main issue with the story that kind of holds it for me being like a 10 out of 10 situation is because like we rarely see the Harbinger, you defeat her at the end, and then like you don't really know much why they were there in the first place. Again, like I said, it's very CE style. Like you don't need to know why you're doing everything. You just need to know that you need to stop it because they are doing bad things. You know that they're doing bad things. You just can't let that happen. And at the very end of the game, guys, it finally learned the pilot's name. And it's just a name, Fernando Esparza. 343 teased this, so you're saying like, oh, you know, you'll learn about his name later on in the game and stuff like that. Which I was like, oh, why hide the name? Maybe there's some kind of thing tied to his name that like, maybe it's actually like a villain, but he became like the UNSC or something like that. No, she, he's just a dude. He's just a dude. Nothing wrong with that. I just gotta feel like 343 kind of built out expectations for his name revealed to be something like special. And it was just, you know, Fernando Esparza, that's his name. And that end credits cutscene guys with Atriox coming back, I was like, yes. I was right about that. <laughs> That's pretty much how I thought was going to happen with Eshram being like the main villain. They focus on that. And then, of course, like well, we would have killed Eshram. I was totally expecting that. And then at the end, Zero Atrex like walk through a portal or something and be like, looks like I need to finish this fight. So excited to see Atrex come back. I would hate to see him just get killed off screen. His character is way too important to the storytelling of Halo as a whole. I mean, he's the leader of the Banished to have him die off scene would just be terrible. It's like what they did with the Didact, right? Where they killed them off screen in a comic. Like, what? Why would you do that? Be it that comic was really awesome, but still, like, you can't do that, man. So the story itself really sets up the pace of moving forward for Halo. Really well done. I absolutely love this campaign. The gameplay and story, I think, is amazing. Like I said, there were some aspects of it I think could have done a little bit better, but that's why I give it, like, a 9.5 out of 10, guys. Like, this campaign is so good. It's finally, like, a moment where a 343 game where, like, it let me just, like, get overly hyped about the game and then also have it deliver at the same time. 
So if you're new to the channel or missing any content from me recently, check out this playlist right here. I'm gonna link to all my Halo Infinite news and informational videos I've been uploading daily about. So thank you so much for watching. Greatly appreciate it. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out.